Okay. So let's have our December meeting start. And as we always do, we can start by uh, looking at the agenda for the evening, which will include uh, welcoming any new visitors, which may not be the case, but in case I did miss someone, we shall welcome them in just a moment. Talk about some exciting bird sightings that you may have uh, witnessed since our last meeting or recently. Um, talk about the identification challenges, which I made super easy this week. Uh, any community business, um, bird counts, open discussion, and then monthly presentation, and then we'll conclude for the evening. So I don't think there's any new members, but if there is, please feel free to use the chat or the audio and introduce yourselves. Either being shy or there isn't anyone, we shall move on to talk about some bird sightings. What fun things have we been seeing lately? Well, this is Pete. Um, I finally got a purple finch in the backyard. It was a female, but uh, it, it, uh, she came in with a group of uh, house finches, and it was very obvious that she was not a house finch. Well, that's funny. We had a similar experience a couple of times, um, a female Purple Finch has spent the day here, so that's been, been nice. We're still waiting for evening grosbeaks. If anybody sees any, please send the alert. <laughs> I had the same experience in Chesapeake with the female Purple Finch coming in just as he described. So there must be a lot of them this year. Uh, this is Dave. Um, I've had some pretty good luck with the uh, the purple finches. I've had as many as 24 at one time, a uh, mixture wow. of males and females. Um, it slowed down. I'm, I'm getting about uh, oh, 10 or 12 um, pretty much every day. But the, uh, the good news um, was I had a male Baltimore Oriole show up this week for been here every day. Nice. I had one for about a week, I think, but it's been gone over a week. I had help from club members. I thought it was a, a different Oriole, but it was definitely a Baltimore. Anyone else? Um, yeah, it's something that uh, we, or, um, I was at Craney today and uh, it, interesting bird showed up it actually um we found it dead on on the rock wall but it was a brown booby oh it's a bird that you don't usually see around here certainly inland any any mm -hmm. amount this is kathy speaking um i thought i had a yellow warbler at my bird feeder the other day i haven't seen it since but i just thought Huh, that's odd. Any comments, any other thoughts of what it might have been? Well, um, I think the most usual, most likely would be a very bright um, pine warbler maybe. Okay. I just thought maybe it was migrating through kind of late. No, I'm looking at the pictures. No, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a pine warbler. It was all yellow. Oh. Any other guesses? I just thought, well, maybe this guy is migrating through here quite late. Um, other possibility could be orange crown warbler. Orange crown. Okay, I'll look that up. Thank you. Anyone else see anything? Mark Sopko. Hey, I, I had um, seen or heard actually um, tundra swans flying over uh, in the evening. I couldn't see them, but I heard them. Has anybody reported them in, in and around the area? Because I haven't seen them around Matthews at all. 
Um, we had tundra swans flying over our house uh, about a week ago in Chesapeake. So we had a great horn this morning at 5.30. Oh, that's fun. You're up way too early, but that's fun. I've been awake for a while. <laughs> I think um, Bill has heard them as well. Bill yeah, I have. Been. They've been out uh, several nights. Sometimes it sounds like they're coming coming from the direction of your house, which is southeast of me. And yeah, they like our backyard. Yeah, but there's sometimes it sounds like they're over across the street, across um, um, Carrie's Chapel on the other side. And uh, I I had a brown creeper in the yard for the first time uh, this month, so that was pretty cool. Um, this is Kathy speaking again. A few nights ago, we were walking around the neighborhood, and I, I live on just off of 134, just as you're going into Yorktown. And um, it, it happened so quickly, I didn't quite catch the first bird, but it looked like it might have been an osprey. He was chasing a bald eagle. And my neighbor happened to be outside and she saw it too. And she said what she saw was the eagle had something in its mouth and the osprey or whatever other bird was chasing it. And they were, they were going around at it for quite a while, so. So we don't know if the, the bald eagle took it from this bird or what the deal was, but it was quite a show, as short as it was. We have an ornament on top of our feeder called a Cooper's Hawk. He's been, a couple times this week, he's just been perched right on top of our feeder for a good good period of time before he uh, decides to vacate. Oh, that's a good place to be, right, for the buffet. Yeah. And then bald eagles frequently, although we typically think about them being these big majestic birds, tend to scavenge a lot. And there's some research that shows that uh, in winter they switch to even more scavenging uh, behaviors and just stealing food from galls and other things. But I know on the Eastern Shore, it's pretty easy to see not just the Eastern Shore, but that's when I've seen it a lot. Uh, bald eagles in fields for, uh, at deer carcasses because they get hit, mm -hmm. they kind of just fall off the road, and you frequently can see the bald eagles relatively easily when that main stretch up to um, Maryland or Chincoteague or wherever you might be going. So, uh, not an uncommon behavior, though Osprey seem that seems like they should have all left by now. Yeah, Maybe. that's what I was thinking too. But it was just so fast. It was black and white. Hey, there's, there's still a few ospreys around, not very many. There were two at Cranny today. All right, so let's move on to our identification challenge. <laughs> you are a bird. Christmas dinner. Uh, could be. Go get my dinner tonight. I'm hungry. <laughs> Chickens during the during COVID because they haven't gotten a haircut. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was gonna say dinner. <laughs> so in this case, it's let me check the chat because someone put a comment there. Oh, sorry, that just came through. That uh, Mark was noting he saw a red tail hawk. So these are three French hens. We oh. <laughs> oui. turtle doves. <laughs> yeah. So those are two turtle doves. Here's the partridge. <laughs> no pear tree. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, so that's a nice gray partridge. That uh, if you're in the Midwest and slightly west too, they're a little bit easy to see in the snow banks because they come out along the roads, pick up gravel and things along the road edge. Or well, when snow plows come through, they rip up some of the side of the road. So when I was in Minnesota, they would come and feed on the grasses and such that the snow plow kind of flipped over and exposed some of that seed bank. But yeah, a partridge, but not in a pear tree. If you really want to find one, there's plenty on Photoshop things, but I picked one that was a little bit more natural. 
So I don't think we have anything from membership and I didn't see Gwen here, but if Gwen you're here and you would like to say something, please feel free to. Hospitality, I know Jane and Diane, um, I just kept this from last year. We haven't really had much because we're not meeting. Uh, newsletter, Tom, is there anything you wish to uh, put forth? Tom, you're I'm, mute if you um, are talking. Sorry, I'm very sorry. Please uh, uh, send any uh, input for the January, February newsletter to me by the 20th. That would be uh, writings and photographs, if possible. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, I guess the actual uh, uh, photos of the winners of our uh, uh, photo uh, uh, contest would be uh, important to have. I would appreciate that. that. That's it. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So speaking of the photo contest, Mike, do you want to say anything about that I did send an email out. Sure thing. <clears throat> I'll follow up with what Sean said. Um, one of the things that's happening with some of the photos that are being submitted, I believe that they are being cropped before they're sent and they're coming in in very low resolution. So it would be really handy if you were to send the original photo. Uh, I looked through the ones that we have uh, getting ready to be published or shown. It'll be probably tomorrow, since today's the last day, let's go to midnight uh, to submit photos. But um, I have 2.5 to 5.5 uh, megabyte uh, photos, and those seem to be working real well as far as clarity goes. If they're cropped, they become really low resolution, and they're just not doing the birds um, or yourselves justice. So. Try to send the original photos if you can. Otherwise, I'll follow up with uh, a, a um, helpful hint or suggestion to resend them so that we can uh, post them on Facebook, which should be live again tomorrow. So keep up the photography and keep sending them my way. Thank you very much. Great. Thank Mike, you. Mike, this is Kathy talking. Could you provide us with your email address? Absolutely. So um, it's all lowercase and it's just Michael period Meyer and it's M E Y E R um, at C N U dot E D U. Okay, thank yep. you. Sure thing. Absolutely. Uh, that's I'll it. also put uh, Michael's email in the chat. Okay. Yeah, I can do that as well. Oh, okay. thank you. Yeah, I'll go ahead and put that in right now. And the club officers, people running committees and so forth, uh, uh, the back of the newsletter has their uh, contact information, their emails and phone. The, the very back page of each newsletter. As well as on the front page of our webpage, which will take us to uh, Wendy and Ellis. Do you have any comments about our web page? Uh, not today. It's... Okay. All right. Well, I think everything's running kind of on its own, so we're doing good with that. All right. Bill, do you want to bring up Christmas bird count information again? Sure, and I'll just uh, give everyone an update. Um, I have enough volunteers to do all 13 sectors. Uh, so I'm good there. Uh, I have now six volunteers to do feeder counts, and I would sure like to get more of those. So please uh, contact me if you'd like to do a feeder count. Um, just ensure that you are actually within the circle, but if you're not sure, uh, just send me your address and I'll check. Um, I'll make a quick comment about uh, COVID. The, the governor is going to increase the uh, restrictions on Monday because the counts are going up. In Virginia. Um, it, it shouldn't affect our count uh, directly because um, he's putting up a stay-at-home order from midnight to 5 a.m. Uh, unless you're doing owling, um, you probably won't be out. 
Uh, but it's a good time to remind everyone, if you're participating in that count and you don't feel comfortable doing it because things are getting worse, please don't hesitate to, to back out. Um, we've been assured by Audubon that if, if you don't get part of your sector, even or, or even if your entire sector doesn't get done this year because of COVID, it's not going to affect the quality of the database. So please, if you're worried about your safety, uh, let me know, and uh, it's, it's just fine if you can't make it. And that's all I have, Sean. Okay, thanks. I just want to plant the seed in your mind, although we'll have a meeting before our January field trip date, but um, that plan is to go to Beaver Dam. I wanted to plant that seed along the lines of COVID is trying to keep our numbers down to a minimum to reduce any potential um, chances for infection. And of course, we'll all keep a good eye and ear to what's going on as the holidays pass and more people will unfortunately come in contact with each other. But just think about stuff in the future because there is a list. And if you wish to get on that field trip list, you can contact um, Harry, who's not here tonight, but I put that in anyway. So the second to last thing I would like to talk about is something that Charm brought uh, forth, and that is a small fundraiser um, related to these beautiful Christmas ornaments. And I'll turn that over to um, Charm. And then the same information we followed up via an email, but I did want to make sure that all those that are present got a chance to um, hear some more details. All right. All right, so I can't see myself. I see what you have up there. Uh, I don't know if you can turn this on so you can see me here. Okay, okay. Oh, share sorry. screen. I don't know. He's He's got the controls. Yeah, so if I stop share, then we can see you. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is number one. <laughs> and these things are just unbelievably cute. I don't know if you remember the big fundraiser we had. Was that two years ago or three years ago? And Barb Connolly actually made quite a few things. Her husband, Dan, is now retired and he's gone into woodworking or wood turning. So if you want to bid on these things, there's number one. Dave Euchre said, how big are these things? And I went, these are just too cute. They probably have a hundred of these, but these five are up for auction for our club. All proceeds will go to the club. So I've already bought some, but not of this set, some others. And uh, this this was just really cute. This is a sombrero. I'm sorry. That's just too cute. That was number four. And then the fifth one is the acorn. Um, and, and if you think you not only want to buy some or all of these, uh, please get back to me before the 18th of December and tell me what you want to bid on them. If anybody comes in with a higher bid than you've put in, I'll get back to you and say, ooh, there's a bid for $20. Ooh, there's a bid for $25. They are just adorable. And if you want more than what these five are, uh, you certainly can just buy them directly from Dan. He's, he has close to 100 of them right now, and they've, they're selling like hotcakes. But I thought it was really nice that Barb and Dan, who used to be members, um, Dan got medically retired and uh, is looking for something to do with all his free time now. And their house is totally decorated in bird. They have 14 bird feeders in the backyard. And this is whatever you are willing to bid on any of these, I will get them to you. You just need to write out a check to the HRBC once we see you know, who's buying what for how much. Could any I questions? Copy of the picture for the, for the web page. Uh, the, the picture it's, has been put it's up. It's what on the Sean screen. has here. Yeah, and I can send that to you, Ellis. Try to get it posted so people can look at it and make their judgments in regards to making bids. Yeah, I'm making a very short suspense date on this only because Christmas is the next week and I'm sure you want to buy these for Christmas. Pete's already bought me two. <laughs> okay, great. But they and, are really gorgeous. Yeah, and they're pretty big too now that we have, you know, holding them up. They're, yeah. Like they're substantial in size, so that's They're nice. about, uh, you know, four inches, four, five inches. And this one's bigger than that one, but not by much. 
And and this one number, I forget which number this is right now, has got a base on it so it can sit. No, that's number two. That's number two. Good. I'm so glad you recognize it. No, I, I have two computer screens so I can see right. the pictures. Right. But these are all done basically with maple. Um, Dan was given a bunch of poles and he just took these poles and started playing with them. Okay, great. So look for an email coming out about this as well, especially for members who aren't here this evening. Remind them if you converse with them. I cut someone off. off. Who wanted to say something else? Well, this is John. I, I had a question. Um, this is a fundraiser for? HRBC. Okay. Um, and whatever, I mean, he's asked, he said the minimum bid should be $15. And let's say this one would go for 25. So I would tell that person, write your check out to HRBC for $25. Okay. I know we're going to broadcast this to the entire membership. Please. And tell them to send it with their friends and anybody that they think might be interested. I wasn't volunteering. I was just asking. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, this is the first uh, I've heard of this. <laughs> uh, an email went out two days ago, John, including you. Yeah, you should have got one from the board for me uh, with Charm's forwarded email as well. So we can investigate why you're not getting that. Yeah, well, that would have been today because I, I haven't read all of today's email. So. Okay. No, it would have been yesterday or the day before. Are you using the Gmail account or the other account? Both? Okay. Sorry, I have no idea why you didn't get it. That's okay. Um, and... Are we done with this? Because I have another yep. item just... of interest. Um, obviously, this is an unusual year, and a lot of our members pay their dues at the meetings. And of course, we, we aren't having meetings. So a lot of our members haven't paid their dues. Um, just wanted to let you know, there are 41 out of our 81 members who have not yet paid. That's, um, it's usually around this time more like 70, 30, or 80, 20. So, fine. I'll send out That's a reminder. I, I think there are some members who, some that didn't you know last year, simply because they, for some reason, didn't attend or weren't able to attend. And their attitude was, if I can't come to meetings, then I'm not going to join that year. Well, and the thing is for membership is to support the club and its activities and the things we do out in the community. So I would say a really good email sent to those 50% uh, of the club that hasn't paid yet. Say, we know that it's been a rough year, but we are so looking forward to your continuing support for all the good programs we do in our community. Thank you. That's for about, that's about to happen. I hate to do it during the holidays, but yeah. I'll be sending that out. Just yeah. wanted to let you know where we stand. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know if I've paid I'm not, this is Barb. I'm not sure that I've even paid. You go, have paid, although I have? all the board, all the board okay. members have paid. I believe, I'm pretty sure, I'm 95% sure everyone attending today has okay. paid. So don't pay again. Some have paid again and found themselves paid for like two years now. <laughs> That's not a bad thing, but uh, yeah. I'll, I'll send a reminder to those who haven't paid. So if you don't get it, Hey. Okay, thanks, John. I appreciate that. And I can put something in the newsletter so it also comes a bit after the holidays within the president's perch for January. Okay, any other important points or maybe not so important points to bring up in our open discussion? Okay, hearing none, then we shall move on to this evening's uh, presentation. As I had noted uh, a little bit before the meeting started, um, when I first got involved with the club six or seven years ago, um, one of the first things that I was trying to do as I incorporated myself into the community was to ask Dave, who was president and was a much better president than I was, if I could talk and give a presentation. And one of the things I was thinking about because it was January was one on winter ecology. So 
I've dusted off that presentation and incorporated a lot more bird-centered themes within it, but I thought it would be fun to talk about that again this year. And so this evening, what I would like to talk to everyone about is winter ecology and thinking about how organisms are able to survive the cold, especially as the last few days have been a little bit chilly. I think one of the first things that we can make sure we have as a context as we move forward and talk about these themes is what is ecology? So what would be special about winter ecology? And ecology has a lot of different facets. And it's a common theme that comes up with many of our speakers. It was a major driver with even the evolution talk that Pete gave. And of course, it was the main focus with Chance's talk just a few months ago. Ecology is really interested in looking at how organisms interact with each other and their environment. And in particular, one of the things that a lot of ecologists wish to gain from those interactions is understanding the distribution and abundance of organisms as a very basic line of investigation. So I want us to look through a few slides now and just think about what questions do you have about the organism that you're seeing as it relates to its interactions with others of its own species, other species, and also its environment, in particular in the context of winter, climate and conditions and weather. And also, what kind of questions could we ask about where it's found? What is it doing? Why are there few of these? Why are there many of these? And, you know, we've had some of those questions similar tonight when we were talking about the finches showing up in our areas, or talking about behavior between ospreys and bald eagles as well. So I'm gonna guide you a little bit. So give you a little image to put you in the mood, relax your mind and start thinking about organisms and their interactions. So I hope one of the things that you thought about as you were looking through both plants and animals that are endothermic, or we sometimes call warm-blooded, and ectothermic, which we sometimes, although frequently incorrectly, call cold-blooded, is how can we survive this winter season? In particular, winter is very hard for a lot of different organisms. Part of that has to do with the cold. The cold's really going to mess up a lot of things as it relates to physiological processes, just staying warm if you happen to be endothermic, making enough heat to keep yourself nice and toasty, but also making sure you don't freeze, such as plants. And if you've ever done something like I, some time way long ago, or pretend it was longer than it was, I got in trouble because I wasn't paying attention and I put our lettuce into the freezer. And of course, when you take lettuce out of the freezer, you don't have nice crisp lettuce anymore because you've destroyed all that cellular structure as water expands and it becomes soggy and mushy. And that happens to plants outside when they freeze as well. And also as temperatures get cooler, the rate at which chemical reactions can occur also slows down meaning physiological responses are going to take longer to occur. So the other problem is dealing with a certain amount of variability in the overall environment during wintertime. Some days can be warm, some days can be cold, some days can be rainy, some days can be snowy, especially here in the mid-Atlantic where winter tends to be more heterogeneous and more variable from day to day than it is during our warmer summer months. 
we also are going to have to think about the way that which organisms are dealing with these changes. And these will be more pronounced, of course, at higher latitudes and also higher altitudes. And of course, winter will be coming sooner and having a larger impact in more mountainous regions than they do here in Virginia along the coastal plain. In particular, affecting uh, ambient temperatures. And here in the Hampton Roads, we have a little bit of a cushion because we're surrounded by water that acts as a nice heat sink, keeping our temperatures somewhat moderate. Although as you move inland, they becomes much cooler. Although in our area, we are dealing with higher humidity, so it feels a good bit cooler. And we have increased winds, which will also increase the overall wind chill effect, making it feel much colder. But something everyone's having to deal with is fewer hours of daylight. Now, these three components are going to join together to influence how organisms are going to survive in their daily behaviors. In particular, one of those behaviors that we'll talk about a good bit is that of getting food. How can we get food? Where can we get food? And how much food can we get? Especially if we only have a few hours to go about and do everything that we would normally do in a longer period, in a much shorter period of daylight. Interestingly, if we look at one third of all the bird species, that third needs to deal with this seasonal change, which we call winter. So how is it that animals are able to go out and survive the cold? And how is it that plants are also able to do this? Well, animals have some strategies, which we'll talk about this evening. One is migration. We'll talk about hibernation some, because of course it's a important topic, although birds really don't hibernate. And we'll talk about some examples of doing something similar to hibernation known as torpor. Uh, we'll also talk about behavioral resistance or physiological resistance to the cold and freezing. And we'll just hit a little bit about plants that are going to use hibernation or dormancy, uh, resistance to freezing or avoidance completely from these cold uh, conditions. One of the keys, as I've mentioned before, is that ice is going to kill. These freezing of cellular structures are going to rip apart those cells and are going to um, harm those animals frequently in ways that cannot be repaired. They do the same thing for plants. They can bust up the vascular tissue of plants. They can impair the overall photosynthetic compartment or the leaf in major ways, but also Sometimes it's advantageous and some plant seeds need to freeze. Some insects need to go through a period of time to complete pupation by having extreme cooler temperatures or actually freezing so they can complete their life cycles. Now, a lot of what I've framed and given context for is the negative side, but I also want to present to you this positive side that for some life cycles, freezing of plants is important and for some insects, freezing of them is going to be important as well. Now there tends to be two strategies to stop this freezing from occurring. And that is freedom avoidance in which you are going to make sure your body liquids are going to stay liquefied. Or freeze tolerance where you can have some ice formation but it's going to be limited and you can control where that is occurring. Now, there are some behavioral components that help us out with this freeze avoidance. So burrowing is a good habit that a lot of organisms use to avoid freezing. You just need to get down deep enough where the soils maintain um, warmer temperatures, temperatures above that freezing line. You see this for many different insects. Also, you see this in a number of different snakes. In particular, garter snakes are known for their denning behavior, especially uh, up north in New England and into Canada. And you also see this with rattlesnakes as well. A number of them move into cool, moist environments like salamanders, or some completely spend the winter under the waters in mud where it is not going to freeze because water stays warmer longer. And in fact, once you freeze a pond over, the underlying water stays a bit warmer as well. This is easy for frogs because they can respire across their skin. 
Snapping turtles actually keep their mouths open and use a similar process of throat weaving where you have exchange of gases across that thin lining of the mouth and throat. And then painted turtles are actually changing their overall metabolism to lower it so low that they actually will not require that much oxygen to exchange in order to stave alive. So they basically suspend all of metabolic activities. They don't need oxygen and they just wait out to the next season. Now, some frogs, however, aren't going to go forth and dig deep into the mud and wait out the winter. Some are going to find deep leaf litter or burrow under some uh, loose soil, but they aren't able to escape freezing. So a very famous example of this is going to be the wood frog, which we have in the western part of the state. And this also does occur to a lesser extent with the gray tree frog. And what this frog does is it releases sugars from its uh, storages to make it harder for ice crystals to form, especially around its internal organs. So ice can form outside of cells, but it's not forming within cells because this high sugar matrix stops ice crystals from forming and that frog is allowed to survive that freezing process. And so you would have a frog diagrammatically dealing with these cooler temperatures. It's moving a lot of water outside of its cells, increasing the overall concentration of sugars. They also start to break down the storage of glycogen into the simpler sugars that they can then use to pack those cells with. And so ice forms outside of their body but not within those cells or the cellular bodies, but not within the cells. And then that animal can uh, freeze for a number of months. And then as they slowly warm back up, that is reversed. Their cells become rehydrated from that dehydration process. And now that frog is active once again. In fact, wood frogs are the only amphibian that's found within Alaska. And they utilize this behavior in the Western part of the state, just as they do in Alaska. Now, if you go out in a snow covered area, you might come across these wonderful little insects that are out and about. And if you're in an area that maintains the amount of snowfall, unlike here that it tends to melt, you actually are able to have algal blooms or growth on top of the snow. And these little critters come out called calembola or springtails. No doubt you've seen these anytime you've gardened you've dug through some soil, you've flipped over a log, these little white things jump. Or if you have pots and you've shifted pots, you might see these little tiny insects jump. That's why they get the name springtails, because they hop, a little spring-like action. Um, they're also known as calembola, sometimes known as snow fleas. And if you're out and about, you can see them feeding on the algae that is on top of the snow, sometimes coming to the surface to warm up and picking up little debris that have fallen and have been found on that snow. So there's a little coin, which is a dime. You can see how tiny these creatures are. That's a deer footprint that's just covered with these columba. Then you have a nice zoomed in photograph of how cute these little guys are. Another great insect that's out and about scavenging for food, and it's easier to see both of these because as you know, they're black, is when the snow falls. When the snow isn't there, they're still active. It's just really, really hard to see this dark insect that's super tiny on a dark background unless you lay on your belly and look for them. And of course, if it's cold, you really don't wanna lay on your belly looking through um, the ground for these wonderful creatures. But one of my very favorites is something called a snow scorpion fly. They're related to a larger, more common group called the scorpion flies where the males have these massive genitalia that look like a scorpion sting uh, scorpion flies are a really romantic group of insects where they go out and they present nuptial gifts to the female. So they actually give the females dead insects to win her heart. Although not all scorpion flies are dominant and are able to keep their insects, so some gather piles of smaller insects. And then those that are really not um, that dominant make spit piles to offer as a gift. So they just regurgitate their own saliva to present. Just letting you know it is the Christmas season, so in case you're looking for a present, 
big insects, of course, better than spit piles. But you can find these guys out in the snow as they wander about. Uh, of course, they are found in mosses. You can find them. They're just really, really, really hard to find if they're not on snow. Another insect, and then we'll move away from insects, because I know some of us could listen to me talk about insects all evening, while most of us probably don't care to do that, is the winter ant, Penelopsis in Paris, which I have collected in our region every month of the year. And I always make it a point to try to collect some on New Year's Day, just to show that they're out, even in the coldest temperatures. I mean, they're out and about foraging for different food items, but one of the things that they do is keep aphids or scale insects down in their colonies where it's not freezing. And there's aphids and scale insects are going to feed on plant sap in the roots of the plants and regurgitate that as droplets of sugar water, just like the ants who deal with aphids during the summertime they tap their heads, uh, the antenna to the butts of the ant. The ant then gets the sugar water from the aphid. The ant protects the aphid. The aphid gives that creature its sugar water. Now, that's great that some things can remain active even in these very cold temperatures. And frequently, those insects are doing things much like the frog does. That is, they reduce the overall concentration of water and increase the amount of sugars that prevent water from forming. Another strategy is to get rid of what are called nucleation sites. That is where ice crystals can start to form and that rids the possibility of freezing. And there are some uh, ticks, unfortunately, that utilize bacteria that are living within their body cavities that act as points that stop nucleation or ice formation from occurring. So they have a lot of bacteria, no ice can form, and then those ticks are more likely to survive the winter and, of course, move on and complete their life cycle in the springtime, which is bad news for anyone who wants to avoid ticks. Those creatures that are trying to not have to be active might just hang out and try not to freeze in an area known as an hibernaculum. So a lot of our terrestrial amphibians and reptiles just go to a burrowing site or a a refuge site where they can hang out, doesn't completely freeze, and they wait. Uh, oftentimes that's a cave or some kind of bric a brac where they're able to survive that winter. And you can go and do this yourself. So you just need to dig a deep enough hole that's below that freeze line, fill it with stones and sticks and bricks and material with some entrance places. So you can use um, some pipes. If you use plastic pipes, it is suggested that you rough them up with um, some sandpaper or some other abrasive. So when you stick them down into this newly created rocky, woody area, that they can climb back out in the springtime. Cover that with soil to act as an insulation layer, and you can have lizards and snakes and frogs and even baby turtles that move down into that area and wait out the harshness of the winter to then recolonize your yard, acting as insect control, food for birds, depending on what birds you might have in that area, but make your backyard a thriving ecosystem. Along this lines of having this hibernaculum, is some creatures, insects, some of our um, snakes, but a lot of small mammals rely on snowfall because snow itself makes a wonderful insulation layer. And they live in an area known as the subnivial plain, where snowfall occurs. And as you have an increase in the snowpack, normally around 8 to 22 inches, it makes a wonderful insulation layer. So if you're below that, it can be anywhere between 5 to 10 degrees warmer than it is if you're exposed at the top. And of course, we've all seen pictures of red foxes trying to bust through the snow to get to the voles and mice that are living underneath. And hopefully we are aware of ptarmigan as well as grouses that kind of move down into this freshly falling snow that hasn't really frozen and become a hard concrete matrix and use that snow as a wonderful blanket to sleep winter evenings away. Now, again, that really helps, but it has to be deep 
And if it's deep, then you get this nice layer. And one of the things that I want to bring up is that the changing of climates are going to shift overall precipitation. In some areas, you do not get the same amount of snowfall. Therefore, you do not build a snowpack. And these creatures now must deal with cold temperatures, but not the blanket of snow that would provide protection as it has in the past. Now, this works for, again, insects and small mammals, but you also have this as a way of protecting plants. And oftentimes this snowpack is going to help with seeds and seed escape, where it doesn't freeze the seeds, they're protected or bulbs are protected. And as the snow melts away, then those plants are allowed to grow in the springtime. Again, one of the things that we often need to think about is ice and that ice is problematic for everyone. So that wonderful blanket of snow is going to uh, help those organisms. And then just some pretty pictures of snowflakes, but showing you that crystalline structure. And of course, you could imagine if you were an organism and this was inside your cell, those crystals are going to rip apart all of the organelles inside of your cell. In fact, that's why if you keep meat in the freezer too long, it tastes odd when you eat it. We call it freezer burn because it has ripped apart the sacs that have uh, enzymes or they have broken down material. And then your cell, your meat, is polluted by those enzymes or broken down material um, from the past. Now, again, freezing is problematic. How do we deal with that? We dehydrate, make sure we don't have any cell formation, and we are able to now survive these conditions. Now, that works for some things, but not everything, because that is a very complicated system and some organisms aren't able to lower their metabolism enough where they're not active. So how can we go about keeping up with changes such as that? And we can find that plants have a lot of problems to deal with because they don't really move, they can't escape, they can't migrate, they aren't pumping up a lot of excess sugars to protect themselves because they'll need those sugars to give a boost in the springtime. And so what we do have is a lot of plants having to deal with, unfortunately, these constant risk of freezing. So one way is the plants just go dormant. Although you will note that in this image, you can imagine that plant is dealing with one, excess weight because of the ice. Two, those cells in that plant, if full of water, are going to be frozen solid as well, whipping those plant cells apart. So we have to be careful. Sorry, Henry's trying to bust in. I apologize. Uh, with those plants. So one of the things is a lot of different trees are going to drop their leaves. And so no leaves, you don't have to worry about them freezing. If you do have leaves, you can coat them with waxes or increase the salts within those leaves and protects against that freezing uh, problem as well. One of the big things is that water isn't available for photosynthesis for the most part, especially as we move further north. So even if you did have your leaves, you wanted to photosynthesize, the water is frozen. You can't move it up into plant vascular tissue. So why keep the leaves anyway? Also, if you're going to have this problem with moving water about, there's a chance of freezing, especially at night, that's going to impact vascular tissue. It's not worth the risk of having to repair that. It's metabolically costly. So broadly from trees, maples, and oaks, lose their leaves, shut down, and just wait for the springtime. However, evergreen trees, and many of these are going to have needles to reduce the overall surface area, push everything to a nice compact spheroid shape, a needle, so they're going to be less likely to freeze. Super waxy coatings, having a whole bunch of compounds that stop freezing from happening and don't have as much problems with this physiological repair of vascular tissue. So you will see some plants still engaged in photosynthesis, especially those that are going to be pine trees. Now, resistance 
that's nice for plants, but what about our animals? And what are animals going to do as a whole, especially when we start to talk about those that are warm blooded? That is, that they are going to generate their own body heat. Body heat's constantly being lost. You're losing it just through infrared radiation. Anytime you sit down and come contact with something, if you're warmer than it, temperature moves to the cooler object. You also have air currents that are moving away the heat. And of course, you have evaporative cooling. So ears and noses and mouths are going to dissipate heat as well. Now, frequently in the summertime, that's advantageous. So you'll notice organisms that have big ears, like elephants can use that to get rid of heat, uh, panting, getting rid of heat, and even a cool breeze in the summertime moves excess heat away as some of us sweat. In the winter, however, that's a constant loss of body heat. So how can we stop this wind chill from happening, this dissipation of heat from happening? And for many, it's hard. You just can't do it, but you can try to get some of that temperature back. So a number of rodent species, such as Arctic ground squirrels, bask. They stand up and orient themselves in the sunlight, picking up excess heat to keep themselves warm. If you go out west, roadrunners actually lift up their contour feathers along their back, and underneath it's much, much darker, and they bask too, picking up excess heat in those cooler or cold uh, winter months. Now, another group of things that we have to think about is weather conditions. Rain is going to decrease the overall ability to hold heat. Snow, of course, as it builds up helps, but it, when it's initially snowing and melting on you, reduces heat. And for those organisms that are found in aquatic environments, you're going to lose your body heat by 20 to 25 times that if you were just out in the air. And that has shifted the way that some of our wintertime visitors to the Hampton Road region are going to deal with things. So we think about seals, they're more northern, but it gets very cold for them. So they actually come down into the uh, more southern parts here in Hampton Road. Same thing for humpback whales that are here out off our coast right now. Some things that help for some of these creatures are just being big. So if you're a big organism, you hold more heat. If you have a lot of blubber, so this is a cross section of a whale, and you can see that this is just some of the fat is associated with that. So this fat layer that acts as insulation. Some organisms like beavers, as well as uh, river otters and sea otters just have a lot of fur. And in fact, the um, sea otter has the highest density fur of any known mammal, where you have something like 100,000 hair follicles per square centimeter. So if you just count the hair on your head, the entire human head has about 100,000 hairs itself. So you can imagine the density. In fact, that's what drove many populations of sea otters to extinction because they were harvested to make these wonderful mittens, gloves, and hats. Really dense fur keeps air locked in. Air locked in retards the loss of heat. So fur traps that body heat next to that animal. Now again, marine mammals, the way they did it is they got really big. Bigger animals hold more heat. Fatter animals hold more heat. So it's a a dual effect of living out in that environment. Again, some animals just put on more weight as well as more fur. So here we have white-tailed deer, one in the early summer, one in late winter, and you can see just how fuzzier that deer looks in the winter. One of the things I really want you to note is the amount of hair in the ears that it also increases. Now, Oftentimes when we see deer, we talk about the coat colors being different, they're looking a bit more shaggier. But if you take some detailed notice, you can see where the hair has increased because that's a place where you have some of that evaporative cooling making your fuzzy little self earmuffs. Now, if we look at some themes as it relates to the ability for animals to survive in these environments, we find some common outcomes from evolutionary pressures. And one of those is an idea known as Allen's rule. 
So that is, organisms that live in cool environments tend to have shorter limbs than organisms that live in warmer environments. A longer limb allows for more heat to dissipate. A shorter limb keeps that heat in place. And a classic example that solidifies this idea, hopefully for you, is this idea of jackrabbits. So here we have a jackrabbit with very long ears. You can maybe even see some of the venation in there where the veins are going to allow for heat to exchange. Almost a naked ear where you have uh, the ability to see through it, opposed to this snowshoe hair that has much shorter ears. So it reduces the overall heat loss, keeping that body temperature in check. Limbs are also going to be important in a process known as countercurrent exchange that we'll talk about on the next slide. But this is giving you a, a picture of this wolf. This wolf has uh, the veins and arteries lying next to each other. So as warm blood moves out towards the extremities, it is heating up the cooler blood that is returning to the core of the body, therefore maintaining a very close range of temperatures inside of that animal and not reducing the overall coolness of that animal. And you often see this with waterfowl and a lot of wading birds that their veins and arteries are close together that allow for this countercurrent exchange that keeps the core temperature pretty much the same and that animal maintaining its overall body heat. And that's why you might see things like whooping cranes 20 degrees out. How can that bird be in the water? The ducks are out. How can their little legs be in the water? It's so cold. Well, the answer is countercurrent exchange. You also have the ability for animals to shunt the level at which their vascular tissue is in contact with the um, skin. So even us, when we get cold, our vascular tissue is going to shrink down and move away from the surface, therefore keeping it more compact and having us maintain a core temperature. When you're hot, it expands out or dilates, moving towards the surface to dissipate that heat. Another common ecological rule that we see, especially with a lot of birds of prey, is going to be Gogler's rule, which talks about organisms that are in warmer environments tend to have more pigmentation, than those that are in cooler environments. And that is thought because of a need for protection of um, ultraviolet radiation. Uh, here you can see a hail falcon that is very nice and white, a common color morph. But a more interesting display is this with these great horned owls that we go from those that live high in the taiga or near the Arctic Circle down into uh, the eastern United States, this is the Pacific Northwest that they're living within the uh, temperate rainforest, and they're a much darker bird than those that are living at higher latitudes. Another example is just the overall size. We talked about marine mammals, keeping bigger size, keeping more weight, keeping more heat. And we can see that through Bergman's rule, where parts of the population that are more southern tend to be smaller. And one of the things that we have too is that in northern populations, they become larger. Now, I picked, although this isn't um, completely kosher, key deer to show you how tiny these deer are compared to deer that are harvested in the Midwest. Uh, so Midwest, Western states, white-tailed deer get quite large. But if we pick some deer in, um, Florida or Georgia, they would be smaller in overall structure. Now I picked the key deer in Southern Florida to show that because it's easy to get this scale and that's the point I wanted to show you. But the problem with the key deer is they also live on islands and there's a phenomenon where you live on an island, big animals get tiny because of limited resources. Small animals tend to get big because of lack of competition. So you can see that with mammoths that move to certain islands like the Channel Islands off the coast of California. Big mammoths got tiny, also in Crete, uh, the island of Juarez in Indonesia. Equally small animals like monitor lizards can get quite large like Komodo Island in Indonesia as well. So noting, I'm using this just to illustrate a point, but I'm not 
well, I did tell you all the details, but note that I'm kind of cheating with how much white-tailed deer shrink. But if you actually measure from Alaska down into Mexico, white-tailed deer are going to get smaller as you go to more warmer environments. Now for mammals, one of the things that they deal with besides some of these rules is just get more fur, more fur, more warm, more fat, more warm, being bigger, you're also warmer. But let's think about birds. Can birds make more feathers? Can birds just put on more fat? Can birds just be larger? And this is an important thing to consider because more feathers, okay, you can probably produce more feathers, make higher density of feathers. More fat, however, is in part going to limit flight. Larger size is also going to have an impact on flight. Birds are in this constant evolutionary tit for tat as you get in ornamentation or bill strength or horns on bills, for example. You have to then pay the cost of having extra weight, needing extra muscles to facilitate flight. So we can think about birds dealing with cold in this idea known as a Goldilocks syndrome. Not too big, not too small, but just right. Too tiny, you freeze. Too big, you can't fly. You gotta be just right in order to survive. And so birds, however, because of the nature of their feathers, the ability for their feathers to overlap, make these nice poofy um, puff balls of air pockets around their body, or kind of a down, the reason unfortunately that we often uh, historically harvested these birds to make down jackets is to make that air pocket for us to stay warm. And if we look at a kinglet that's only about 5.3 grams or three pennies in weight, its overall body weight is something like 50% that of feathers. So if you look at all the feathers as a little bird, most of it's made up of feathers, especially in the winter time. Okay, meant to delete that slide. So let's move on talking about birds further, as well as just giving some hints back to some mammals. So a lot of birds, because of the inability to hibernate or the ability to freeze themselves or completely go underground because they're birds and they're going to be flying, they're going to have this constant battle when it has to deal with energy conservation. And one of the ways that they deal with this is going to be just avoiding. And we will talk about migration in just a little bit, but one great way, just move away. When it's really cold, migrate to some other place. You don't have to deal with going and dealing with that cold weather. Also, you're able to do a few things, and that is make your own micro habitat, make your own micro climate. So some birds construct elaborate nests, or more frequently, a lot of birds are going to these, do this aggregated huddling. That is, chickadees and bluebirds are this classic example where they have a little cavity and multiple chickadees use that in the evening all giving off heat and cushioning each other from those cooler temperatures. Bluebirds also often share cavities, all bundled together, sharing each other's body heat. And of course, the flying squirrels are going to be a famous example that also do this throughout the winter as well. Now, some other mammals just have complicated nest that they use. In this case, the lodge for beavers and beavers like many other rodents are going to be active all winter. Now, sometimes we have the idea that all rodents are going to sleep like Arctic ground squirrels, but many, many rodents are going to be active all year round. Beavers and squirrels are going to be active and you don't have the chance just to sleep those conditions away. So a good way to do that is the way the beavers do. You build a big dam, everyone hangs out in your lodge that's associated because of the building of the dam, which floods the area, giving you a warm pocket of water or warmer. You submerge all your food underneath, you come out, you get some food, you go back, and you have your nice little lodge or your sauna where you're able to survive. And that idea of kind of building a pocket of air of warmth around you, as I mentioned before, is utilized by things like grouse and ptarmigans that are going to hunker down in the snow where it can be much warmer as a tiny little microclimate 
for that animal to survive the cold of the winter. Now, something that you might not have thought about is the way a bird is going to spend its day. What is it going to do? And it's all, again, this constant idea that comes up, and Pete talked about this in last month's meeting, of this tit for tat. You're always going to have to give something to get something. So if I spend too much time feeding, I'm not going to have that much time resting. If I spend too much time resting, I'm not going to have time for feeding. I still have to clean. I still have to keep my body in shape. I have to avoid predators. How do I balance this R? And in particular, in winter, it's harder because there's a higher demand for food and for energy, both from those that are eating in the sense of little sparrows and chickadees, but also, as Ellis pointed out, the idea of having predatory uh, birds of prey that are coming around looking for those food items, we need to avoid predation from then, those predators. So a study looked at uh, common loons um, from Assateague Island, and they noticed that they spent 55% of daylight time feeding. Now in the uh, evening, they stopped feeding. They kind of all move from being dispersed during the day to relatively um, confined areas, they kind of group up. Uh, starlings, I mean rather sanderlings, spent 75% of the day feeding uh, in the fall, so August, September, but as we looked at winter time, um, they're going to increase that to 95% of those daylight hours are spent just feeding. And some birds shift those behaviors to encompass longer periods of the day. So if we look at things like black belly plovers and short-billed dowagers and greater yellow legs that are going to bleed up in the Arctic Circle when it's perpetually light, feeding when it's mostly light. Most of their day time is doing the things that they do because the sun hasn't gone down. But now as they migrate south, they're going to shift just daytime feeding into night feeding. In fact, black belly plovers that spend a lot of time feeding at night are going to be found to have more rods that facilitate uh, nighttime seeing than other shorebirds, uh, particularly those three species. And the greater yellow legs that does feed at night, but also feeds on the day, not so much at night, but does feed at night, has more um, cones and rods, but not as many as that black belly clover. So not only are you having these behavioral shifts, you're also having these morphological shifts. So now this bird that for a lot of its time, breeding grounds don't need to see in dark because it's not dark, do have the ability to now see it at night to feed longer to get all that food. And in part, another layer on top of this is they feed on material that is not nutrient rich. It is not calorically valuable. So those organisms that aren't feeding on flesh or meat or things that are high in calories need to feed for a much longer period of time. And we often see that as the case with many shorebirds that are feeding on small crustaceans. You need to get a lot to get that food resource. You also see that with some birds that feed on insects. So this is the white spotted variant moth, a little geometric or inchworm, uh, common and somewhat still active and easily found um, even in the winter time. And they are often found by our cute little Kinglets. And if you watch kinglets, they flutter around the edges of hollies and other understory trees looking for these inchworms. Sometimes they're not actively moving around, but they're frozen, they can be picked up, and they're picking up those tiny insects. Of course, if you're not picking up a lot of those insects, you're going to die. But by constantly flittering and flouting about, you become more visible for predators. But here's that cost benefit. Again, if you're not flitting and flying about looking for insects, you don't have enough storage to survive. You burn through your calories and you die. So how can we deal with this? How can we make sure there's enough fuel for that furnace to keep us warm moving forward? And a lot of that is going to be behavioral as it relates to food storage. So we have food caching. Some we just put it away so we can use it for the future. Some just eat really poor food, but there's less competition with other birds. So there's a lot more resources to eat. So not the greatest food, 
but no one else is eating it, so more food for us. One other way is just to move around. We've talked about some of those wintering finches that are going to be somewhat nomadic, moving back and forth, just trying to find what other resources are out and available and exploit them and move on to another area. Again, not enough food, not enough fuel, not enough fuel, you're going to die. So mammals have it a little bit easier. Um, they're out and about. Oftentimes they have complicated burrow systems or living in these um, uh, nooks and crannies of trees inside of logs, storing a lot of food, uh, caching food for the future. And that's part of their behavior all year. Most birds that do show caching behavior aren't necessarily caching or storing food all year long. That's a behavior that switches on in the fall and into the winter for many birds, not all birds, but many birds switch that behavior then. And so mammals, especially some of these seed predators like chipmunks and squirrels, have already this cache that they built up for a long period of time. But birds don't, especially as we have some migratory behaviors that are going to be uh, influencing birds showing up at different places throughout the year. And therefore, we oftentimes, as birders get excited about these mixed flocks, where you have multiple species that are coming and joining together, and they're doing this simply to make sure there's more eyes looking for food. Now, some people have looked at this idea of more bird eyes, more bird eyes mean more avoidance of predators, but they're actually not doing it to avoid predators. It's about having more eyes and scouts looking for these limited food resources in the environment. Because even when you come across those food resources, it often takes some energy and time to get to them. And we'll see that seeds of very hardness are going to be dealt with differently by different birds. And therefore, you have some food partitioning where really hard seeds might only be dealt with by things that are larger with bigger bills. Smaller seeds sometimes are missed by those birds but are handled by smaller birds. But you can imagine here this cute little sparrow having to deal with a really hard seed spending up to 20 seconds dealing with that seed. But that's a lot of investment in time. It's not going to get all that it needs from that seed. And so we have partitioning, but we also have this idea of form and function influencing those feeding behaviors. And for some groups, like some finches, this specialization on the food resources have influenced their overall ecology and their evolution. And a great example of this happens to be the crossbills, where not only are their bills crossed to facilitate the popping of the bracts of the pine, home, but you also have left-billed and right-billed individuals that are able to open the bracts differently in order to retrieve those pine nuts and utilizing resources differently between those. And if we look at these winter finches that we've kind of had a lucky season looking at um, throughout the Hampton Roads area, you have things like pine siskins that were out and about. We know that there's some evening growth speaks. We've talked about purple finches as well. A lot of these groups are going to specialize in cones. And some of them are going to have a little bit more variation where they're looking at other seed uh, from deciduous trees. And some like the pine growth speak that really feed on the fruits of various trees. Their distribution is very much tied to the production of pine cones, seeds, and fruits. And they shift, as we saw this year, where those plants, because of whatever environmental factors or uh, cyclic factors, didn't produce the amount of resources needed to survive the winter. So they've moved and shifted down further south, which has been good for us, to utilize those resources. And while it's exciting, one of the things that we should all be thinking about is what's happening up north that's driven these birds further south. Part of natural cycles, landscape change, are there just not enough habitats, habitats fragmented? Has climate influenced the reproductive nature of some of those food plants? Again, they're feeding on seeds, helping seeds out, and that's going to be a common behavior that we see with many of our birds 
One in particular, of course, you're going to be able to observe in your backyard with the nut hatches that take the food and hide that food. But many birds are going to forget where they put those seeds and they're actually going to help with seed dispersal. And if we were out west, one great example of this is the Phanapepala that feeds on the berries of mistletoe. And as it goes out and forth, it poops out those seeds high in the trees, and now you have mistletoes being dispersed. Birds uh, locally do that as well, but a very famous example of this bird that really loves mistletoe is the Phanapepala. Now, one of the things to think about with the winter is how do you remember where you put those food resources? And if we look at the memory center of birds, as well as humans, this organizational center called the hippocampus, it is largest across Northern Hemisphere bird families. So if you compare their size to the hippocampus center in the Northern Hemisphere, you find it to be largest in chickadees and titmice, the corvids, which should only have one S, and the nuthatches. These birds that are classically thought of as caching birds that are gonna hide these food items around and about. In fact, members, especially of the corvidae, ray, uh, crows and ravens and jays, that are going to live at lower latitudes, therefore don't need to cache for the winter, have a substantially smaller hippocampus than those that live at more uh, higher latitudes. Therefore, hippocampus size is related to memory, Memory is related to the ability to recall where you hid those seeds in order to find them. Uh, if we look at a 10 gram chickadee, it can only store on its body about the fat needed for one day. So it must store food in order to have enough resources to survive the day. In fact, storing food shifts for that bird. Early morning, it eats, it eats, it eats to replenish the energy it burnt through the night. Midday, it's using seeds as uh, a storage that's using its time to store seed, seeds rather. Then the evening it switches over and it starts feeding again to get enough energy to survive that night to make it to the next day. But blue jays, which are substantially long, uh, larger, have about two days or so worth of energy, store seeds not from day to day, but it's predicting what the weather might be and looking for days that it might not be able to forage, but now you can go back and find food resources because of snowfall, because of rainfall, you have a way to survive these harsh conditions. There's two major behaviors that are related to this caching. That is larder hoarding, where you have individuals that put a whole bunch of things in one place. A uh, famous example of this is the acorn woodpeckers of the West, where you can see that they've stored a whole bunch of acorns in one locality or scattered hoarding where you just kind of put things in multiple locations and hopefully you can recall where you put all those and you can go back and find them. So an example of scatter hoarding are going to be red belly woodpeckers and of course all passerines are going to do this behavior. Now interestingly, and hopefully we were all aware of this, is that birds of prey also are going to hoard, especially in winter. Now many owls do store food in excess in the summertime as well, but is more pronounced in the winter. And normally what they do is they decapitate their prey, they eviscerate their prey, and just keep the body, and they put it in their nest or near their house or nest or roost, and they cache it that way. So the northern pygmy owl typically has 18 to 26 different items in its larder, so it's a, a larder hoarder. The American kestrel that also shows this behavior puts them out across the open landscape in different vegetation um, clumps, and it's known as a scattered hoarder. Interestingly, great horned owls, as well as northern sorbet owls and other owl species, they've hoarded it, they moved it, but it freezes, and you can't eat that frozen item. It'll cool down your core temperature. So males, as well as females, sit over that item like it's incubating an egg, warming up that frozen mouse sickle, that frozen bowl sickle, so it can consume it down, not lower its temperature, but you reheat it itself. And this is very important, as Charm and Bill were talking about, owls are going to be wintertime breeders, They're setting up their territories, they're going through courtship behaviors, 
and having all these calories facilitate that breeding process. Now, a famous example of a hoarder is the Clark's nutcracker, again, another Western species that belongs to the family Corvidae, so it's related to jays and ravens, a very intelligent bird that is able to keep track of its seeds for multiple years. It caches a lot of seeds, uh, 32, 40,000. I've seen one study that talked about this in um, near Yellowstone, that was 75,000 uh, pine nuts and they're planting them all over the place and calling where many of them are so they can go back and find them. But one of the very interesting things are is that they move plants, particularly white bark uh, pines, to places where those trees would not be. And an example of this is on top buttes. So the uh, white bark pine doesn't have a little flange. So some of your pine nuts are going to look like the sat, um, Samira's from maple trees, or the twirly whirlies from maple trees. They have a little wing. The pine bark pine lacks that, so it's not going to be dispersed by air currents. It's only getting on top of these buttes because these Clark's nutcrackers are going out and planting. And there's a pretty famous study that talks about Clark's nutcracker being the Johnny Appleseed of Western pine forests, that they're replanting and replenishing these. Um, habitats, especially some of those habitats that are going to be influenced by fire regimes. It is the Clark's nutcracker that's helping to replant the forest. Now, I mentioned before, some things aren't utilizing those protein or carbohydrate rich things like nuts and seeds. They're eating items that no one else wants. And we can think about them being wax eaters as an example. And two examples that we have, one locally throughout winter is going to be the yellow rumpted warbler that loves, and it is frequently seen in these bayberry or um, waxberry uh, groves, and they're feeding on those wax myrtle. Not that great wax is really hard to break down. It is a complicated system. It involves a lot of investment of um, new, um, enzymes and bile and, um, energy from that bird, but it's not competing with anything. Nothing else is really eating those uh, wax myrtle berries. So it has its pick of all the food that it wants to eat. So increasing the amount of food that you're getting, hiding the food that you're getting is a great strategy to survive. Now, it would be irresponsible of me not to also talk about hibernation. And I just wanna talk about that a little bit to give you an overall a holistic example of winter ecology, and that you do have different stages as well as different levels of um, hibernation. One of the things that is very complicated is if you read different papers or you look at different animal behavior textbooks, they define these differently. So this is something that you're really interested in as you read things about bird behavior, mammal behavior, what have you just pay attention how the author is defining these. So one is known as daily torpor, where you're going to lower your rates and you're going to be able to survive. And you might think about this as a bird example with some hummingbirds to kind of go down, lower their metabolism and are able to hang out for the evening and go in this inactive state. So this daily torpor. Or you can have very much more prolonged inactivity metabolically, which we can think about being a deep torpor or a hibernation event, as well as something known as estivation, where you don't have it that's prolonged, meaning multiple days, but you do have it for maybe up to a day in overall um, inactivity. So you tend to see this mostly in mammals, uh, hibernation will also occur within rodents and reptiles, but I'm talking about those things that are warm-blooded in this context. And this normally because of food variability, lower temperatures, and it's just easier to survive not having to burn calories going out and foraging. It should be noted that bears technically, uh, at least black bears, don't technically hibernate. It's known as winter 
uh, slumber or winter estivation because they can wake up. They're not in this deep state like you would have with an Arctic ground squirrel where you could pick that animal up, move it around, and it's not going to wake up on its own. Again, it's not that common within birds. We have this example of torpor that we see within hummingbirds, but um, not that many other birds have been documented to have this low activity rate because of um, temperatures. A very famous example is with this common poor will in California that was found in the late 60s, 70s. It was uh, pulled out of rock, crevice, uh, rock crevice. It was banded, didn't really wake up, didn't react. It was put back in and then recorded using that same rock crevice for the further three years. And it just kind of slows down and hunkers down and is inactive. And then it start maybe at night because these are nocturnal, it goes out and forage, but no one made any observations if it did that, or if it just stayed really slow metabolism, not burning through calories, waiting for that cold weather to dissipate. Of course, the most famous example of true hibernation is with the Arctic ground squirrels that completely shuttered down their metabolic rates, their breathing rates, their growth rates, and just spend a large percentage of their life sleeping, waiting for the next growing season. Now, I've hinted about this, a way to deal with not getting enough food, not trying to sleep, trying to make sure you don't freeze, is just leave the area and move on and go to another place. So let's end this evening's discussion with a little bit about uh, types of movement. So you can move from roosting to foraging sites. You might see that with gall species. You might also have that with some waterfowl, especially if you're out west where a lot of waterfowl congregate at night, then forage in agricultural fields during the day, such as snow grease, as well as uh, sandhill cranes. Nomadic wandering, like we have with the winter finches, the um, pine siskins and crossbills and even gross beaks, for example or even seasonal movements that we might um, think about with the pleasant Quetzalcoatl that moves up and down mountain ranges of the Southwest, uh, Mexico, because it's looking for fruits that are going to fruit at lower elevations and then move up the mountain as the seasons progress up the mountain. And then of course, move back down to avoid those cool temperatures. A lot of that all has to do with avoidance and energy conservation. So while it's a big investment to make those migratory treks, once you're there, you're not investing in so much um, metabolic energy to stay warm or look for food, avoid predation. You're in an area that's a little bit more stable temperature wise, and you're not burning through as much energy. And you can see this with even very large animals such as whales, that are going to forage in nutrient rich waters of Alaska and uh, the, near the Arctic Circle, but then come down in the winter, hang out, stop feeding in these more tropical waters because there's not as much food resources, waiting for the temperatures to warm up. More nutrients come back in because of runoff, algal blooms, krill move back up, and then you're able to get the food resources that you, of course, need. Those things lead to these dramatic shifts in the overall uh, habitats, lives, and ranges of organisms that we'll call uh, migration. Now there's a few types of migration. There's partial migrations where a portion of that population might actually migrate. And some examples of that are with the American robin that goes from Alaska and Northern Canada down to places like Guatemala and in Central America, where those that might be found in Pennsylvania hang out all year, or if they do move south because of uh, weather conditions, go to Georgia or Florida as the furthest place south. The short distance uh, migrants, such you might find with the rusty blackbird, that's going to move from the boreal forest, but not super far south, less than 2,000 miles. Long distance migrants are going to move more than 2,000 miles. And of course, the, the classic example is the Arctic tern that goes from nearly Arctic Circle to Antarctic Circle. So this huge range of about um, 80,000 kilometers per year, or altitudinally where they go from northern parts of the mountain ranges down the mountain range. 
which you can see with dark-eyed juncos. Now there's some major migratory flyways and again distances, but all of this again is going to be influenced because of food availability. Now interestingly there is a historic context to these migratory patterns. A lot of the non-migrant species or short distance migrants are going to be originating from the Paleoarctic, so from Asia and Europe. And they came over in the last ice age, the Bering, Lake, uh, Bering Sea land bridge, things like woodpeckers and nuthatches and finches that had to deal with cooler environments in their own evolutionary history. So they kind of hang out and are going to be non-migratory. However, these long distance migrants are thought to have originated in the tropics and have moved out and colonized new areas. Of course, when you have these shifts in geological time with glaciers, they had to move down as these glaciers have moved forward and push them back into the tropics. Of course, glaciers retreated, they could move up. And so you have this, this ebb and flow of these tropical birds moving forth, but then needing to come back as the seasons changed or because of glacial movement. So that idea of why leave the tropics in the first place often comes to mind, and it's all about resource competition. There's a lot of birds, there is a lot of productivity in the tropics, but there's a lot of birds, there's a lot of insects, there's a lot of mammals that are utilizing all those resources. So if you can get further north where there's less individuals, less birds, less uh, competitors insect-wise, you're going to have more resources. It might also just be for breeding sites. There's only so many nest cavities, so moving forth reduces overall competition, in this case for nest or food resources, and you are liberated in your lifestyle strategies. A lot of this is going to be driven by uh, changes in the climate and food availability, all about reducing the overall competition and help those species out. In fact, if you look at some of the deep time matters, if we look at uh, the Cantharis thrush genus, where there's 12 species, seven of which are only found in the Eotropics, five are gonna breed back and forth, um, well, in North America, and then winter in the tropics again. So they escape from the tropics where they originated, utilize North America as a place to breed, and then they go back to the tropics to overwinter, or the Caribbean, which I'm still counting as the tropics. The only one that doesn't is the hermit thrush that is going to um, stay uh, in North America throughout the winter. Now, all that's related to navigation, and navigation is a long story to note that it's going to involve light or magnetic uh, fields, some other things like waterways or landscapes, but sometimes birds get that wrong and show up in odd places, as we've all seen in recent years with tufted duck, also Eurasian ridgeon, and I know right now in DC is a barnacle goose that's hanging around the Pentagon at a park that I'm probably going to go see because I spent an entire weekend in New Jersey going from field to field trying to track down a barnacle goose um, a few years ago. So that's one of my big nemesis birds and it was on my mind while I was making this lecture. Now again, it takes a long time for these migratory routes to take foot, but birds are really good at responding to change and shifts in migrations can already be seen. So I wanted to give you some examples. So from about the 1970s onwards, rufous hummingbirds that were mostly Western were showing to migrate and stay along the Gulf Coast and the Southern Atlantic Coast over winter. In fact, a 2014 study in South Carolina found that more male ruby-throated hummingbirds, especially the immature ruby-throated hummingbirds, are sticking around in South Carolina and are not migrating further south. Both of these are linked to landscape level changes where there's more food resources available to them than there were historically. Also, European starlings that were originally built, uh, built let's try that word again, brought over to New York City to have all the birds that were mentioned in the Shakespearean plays 
those birds, some populations migrate hundreds of miles in the wintertime, which also underlines their success at dispersing out. Some birds stay behind after birds move back up north and colonize these new areas. And now you have that bird that's made it across the entire continent of North America. You also have this with uh, the house finch that was introduced into New York City from Western populations. Then they started to move about, colonized a lot of part of New York City, but in the 1940s started to move further south uh, by the 1960s, establishing populations, but also now having these migratory behaviors with northern populations and southern populations. And this is also seen with snow geese that um, portions of the Arctic snow geese go to different places. So some parts come here to the Atlantic uh, seaboard, some go to the Pacific seaboard, also in the interior deserts of New Mexico, and one portion uh, historically goes to the Gulf Coast. However, that historic Gulf Coast population has found subpopulations that are not going all the way to the coast. They're hanging out in agricultural fields and rice fields where they feed and they eat on those items opposed to going to salt marshes and freshwater marshes along the Gulf Coast. And that has driven a change in bill shape and size to better harvest those agricultural corns and rice than those that migrate all the way down and feed on native plants, for example. So migratory behaviors are shifting, but also the morphology of those birds are changing as well. And as we shift and change, of course, climate change is playing a big role of this. Uh, short distance migrants that are going to move maybe further up north or up uh, mountainsides are going to get thing up there earlier because photo period is a major driver, not so much temperature. So changes in day length are going to push them up sooner. And they might find that food resources are past being available. And this is also important for long distance migrants because birds are going to move up thinking they're going to make it in early spring, but early spring now is late spring. The insects life cycle has been completed. The resident birds, I've already started breeding, utilizing resources such as habitats and food resources where these previous long distance neotropical migrants thought they were getting their early setting up territories, but are now coming mid breeding season after insect life cycles and are being heavily impacted by climate change. Of course, sea level rise and habitat loss because of climate change, feed, food availability of seabirds in particular with warmer oceans are going to decimate those populations. And non-migratory species are also just going to have to deal with shifts in the natural community. What plants are there, what insects are there as we get more precipitation, less precipitation, partial winters, warmer winters, changing the overall dynamics that we see. Now, one way that we engage a lot of birds is going to be by bird feeding in the wintertime, which is a wonderful hobby to have. But I do want to note that um, if you don't have a lot of feeders, not that I say you need to go buy a lot of feeders, but if you have a few feeders, you increase the overall density of birds in your area, which can lead to outbreaks of bird diseases. So if it is the holiday time, ask for a few more bird feeders, put them up, keep them a good distance apart so you're not clumping or increasing the overall density just like we're trying to keep a six foot space between us with COVID, help your birds spread out so they're not all congregated in one place, increasing predation and disease spread. Equally, if you just clean your feeders out, um, wash them out even in winter time, it helps to keep down the spread of disease. Now, something that if you're interested in some of those points that I've made, I would like to recommend a winter world, life in the cold, uh, a Guide to Nature in Winter. And then I just got this book as an early um, Christmas present. I just started reading it the other night and a lot of the bird details in this lecture comes from this book. It's chock-a-block full of information about migration, molting behaviors, how birds set up social structures. It's a really nice book. I might write a review for it um, for the newsletter 
but I've been really impressed. It just came out last year in 2019, but it's a really good book. It's made me excited. So you might check out Birds in Winter as well. So if there's any questions, I know I went over a little bit. Um, I'll be happy to take them. If not, we'll end for the evening and we'll see everyone in January. But again, if there's questions, I'll be happy to answer those via chat or you can turn on your audio. Great presentation, John. Yeah. There's a lot of information, and uh, thanks for pulling that together. Yep. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. Very, very interesting. All right. So go get Birds in Winter. Good book. <laughs> thanks, Sean. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Everyone have a happy Bye. holiday Bye, season. Everybody. Yep. Everybody stay safe. Yep. Happy holidays. Absolutely. Happy oh, holidays. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Yep. Thanks, Sean. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.